Church, I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for a beautiful and breezy March morning. It's good to be here. It's good to have all of y'all here. I want to draw your attention to a few announcements that are in the bulletin. First off, our uh, garden kickoff is this Tuesday at 9 o'clock, and that will begin our regular garden hours of Tuesdays and Saturday mornings at 9 o'clock. Any and all help is appreciated. Next Sunday, the 13th, the Administrative Board will be meeting, and we are doing our annual financial audit first thing at that meeting. And as we have proven in the past, it goes a whole lot quicker when there's a whole lot of us there. So please, if you're part of the board, plan on meeting there for that. March 20th through the 26th is our next Family Promise Week. We are looking for meals for our lead for two nights. So two meals. So if you help out with meals, please let Lisa or Linda know. Are there any other announcements? All right. Well, see, none let us prepare ourselves, let us quiet our hearts and our minds as we enter into this time of worship, and Ralph will lead us with a call. <laughs>
Our Psalter this morning is Psalm 91. We will pray this together responsibly. I lead with a regular prayer just ask if you will respond together with a bold prayer. Number 810, Psalm 91. Those who dwell in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, My refuge and my fortress, my God, in whom I trust. For the Lord will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence, and will cover you with his pinions. Under the Lord's wings you will find refuge. God's faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night nor the arrow that flies by day. Nor the pestilence that stops in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes in the new day. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the weakness of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your refuge, the most high your habitation. No evil shall befall you, no scourge come near your tent. For God will give his angels charge over you to guard you in all your ways. They will bear you up on their hands, lest you dash your foot against the sun. You will tread on the lion and the young lion and the serpent. You will trample underfoot. Because they cleave to me in love, I will deliver them. I will protect them because they know my name. When they call to me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. I will satisfy him on life and show him my salvation. Amen. Be seated. Um, before the service, I uh, had a little bit of time to go and, and make the mistake of going on Facebook, which is always a mistake. <laughs> but today, um, what was waiting I have, happened to some part of a Methodist clergy group on Facebook and happened to come across. Uh, where a Ukrainian Methodist pastor shared images and videos of their worship service this morning. And uh, it looked a lot like us, actually. It was amazing how they gathered together. They had communion there before them, and they had their little camera set up as they were zooming so that they couldn't. Have. There's um, some explanation in English. He said that they were able to, to gather with those who were within walking distance, so nobody uh, who couldn't walk there could get there this morning. It's just an amazing thing, a reminder of how united we are around Christ's table. And we experienced similar. And I, I, as I read this Psalter together, I wonder if they themselves had Psalm 91 this morning. It was, would have been the prescribed text, and how much differently these words must fit in the midst of, of such conflict. And yet they shared in their prayer request and they began with thanksgiving. And what an amazing thing. So what are you thankful for? The freedom to worship. Amen. Amen. I'm thankful for my brothers and sisters gathered here today and the opportunity to be here with Thankful for God's love and his beauty and, and showing us springtime. Allergies. <laughs> With the good. Amen. You know, the allergies are the worst complaint we have. What else? I'm thankful for a baby. The baby's name is Darcy. She's in the hospital right now. Okay. She came premature, but she is growing every day and doing better. Excellent. I'm thankful for my children, my children's family, and my past. Well, these are prayers this morning. We want to um, continue to pray for the family of Marvin Gaster following his passing on Friday. Um, and the service will be here tomorrow afternoon at 2 o'clock um, to keep that family in prayers as well as uh, we want to pray for Larry Lloyd, who just for some reason, decided to go back in the eighth bed. I don't know why. <laughs> going back what to the, that <laughs> going back to the, the cardiologist. Hopefully, they'll get that figured out and straightened out. Uh, Wanda asked for prayers for her family following the passing of her nephew Jeff Taylor, and 
Rhonda shared with me the other day that her uncle is in the hospital with COVID. Mm -hmm. How, how's he doing? He's not doing well. Uh, okay. uh, what else is our prayers? You must be doing all right. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. As always, I will lead us in prayer and encourage you to pray along with me and during the time of silence so that the names are on your hearts. <laughs> <laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us here this morning. Thank you for calling to each of us, inviting us into your presence. Thank you for giving us a place at your table, a place with your family. Thank you for the love that you have for us that we do not deserve. We come into this time of worship with humility because we do not deserve it. We have sinned against you and we have sinned against one another and we confess that now. Acknowledging our wrongdoing and acknowledging that we continue to do things that are evil and call them good. We pray that you will forgive us, that you will raise us up by your grace and righteousness that we may go forth and live righteously as you have called us to do. What's more, help us to carry your grace out to this world, to give grace to all as you do, to proclaim your good news to build up your kingdom. We pray for your people who are gathered here today. We pray for your people who are gathered around the world. Knowing that we are united around your table, we are united by your grace and your spirit, which overcomes all obstacles, which overcomes all differences between us. Even those differences that we grab hold of and claim are important. Lord, we pray that you will be with your people today, wherever they are and however they are going. We pray for those who are hurt, for those who are hurting their body, those who are undergoing treatments and surgeries, and those in recovery, and those who told you about recovery. We pray for those who are sick in their minds, who daily battle with illness such as depression, and schizophrenia, and bipolar disorder. So many of those that we take. Dismissively, we pray for the broken heart. We ask for healing and comfort in the midst of sorrows and grief. We ask for comfort in the midst of isolation and loneliness. We heal our bodies and our minds and our hearts and heal our relationships with one another. We pray that you will heal our homes and families and our friendships, heal our church, heal our community. Heal our state, our nation, and heal our world as we once again face war and destruction. For all the need of healing this day, we pray. Arthur Allen, Jennifer Sutton, Reverend Bill and Carol Lee, Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers. Thank you for caring about the things that weigh on our minds and hearts. We praise you for the compassion that you have had for us. We praise you for the love that you continue to have in spite of what we have done. We praise you for giving your son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life for us, that we may have life with you alone. And so we join our voices together in the prayer that Jesus taught us to do. Our Father, who art in heaven, our will be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For I is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Um, we are united together, not just with this church, we are united by the blood of Jesus Christ with all those who take on the name of Jesus Christ, who worship him, who serve him. It's our joy and our privilege to be able to do this together, to pray together, to worship together, to serve together. It's something that all of us bring to Christ, the gifts that he has given to us to build up his kingdom. 
day in and day out here at Center Church. And so I ask if our ushers come forward to take up the tithes and the offerings as they do, I ask that you will give out of God's abundance that you will give to the ongoing mission here at Center Young Church.
Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Praise. Holy Spirit, you are here in the air that we breathe. So breathe life into us that we may be transformed by the hearing and the doing of your word, and that we may be carried forth to transform this world. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. So I don't listen to the radio anymore. I haven't listened to the radio in, in a while now, actually, because when I get in my car and I crank it up, I have this little device that connects to my phone. And I prefer listening to that because on my phone, I am connected to a playlist that I've made called Good Country. And on that playlist, there are 887 country songs ranging from the 1950s to about 1993, because I'm pretty sure nothing good's been recorded since 1993. Right. Right. That's usually what I listen to. I just put it on a shuffle and let it go through all those. I, I looked it up this morning. If I sat down and listened to the entire thing from start to finish, it would take me 48 hours and 28 minutes. That's a long car ride. <laughs> Thankfully, I don't have to listen to all of it once. But my music that I listen to is so easily accessible. But even if I get in the car and I say, you know what, I don't want to listen to this today, all I have to do is just take out my phone and find something else I want to listen to. I can listen to rock and roll. I can listen to classical music. I can listen to oldies. In fact, the other day, my kids, something came up and they were asking who Elvis was. And so, okay, this is a learning opportunity. I put on Elvis and we listened to Elvis for a minute. And Casting said, Dad, I thought you said he was the king of rock and roll. <laughs> I don't know what she expected. Was it his gospel album? It was not the gospel. It was the, all his number one hit. My point is that we have music at our fingertips so easily and readily that we take it for granted to have music. It's all over the place. It's in our cars, unless we don't want it to be in our cars. It's in our kitchens, unless we don't want it to be in our kitchens. We can turn on and off anytime we want. We can find exactly what we're looking for. It fills up a background in our life. So if you go into a store, you go into a restaurant, there's just music playing. You don't even necessarily know what it is. Sometimes I like it when they play like a little music. It's like a little jazz version of some popular song. You listen to it. You actually knew the words to that song. You wouldn't be singing that in public. We're just surrounded by music and it's so available to us that we take it for granted. And more than anything else, we take for granted that it's always been a part of our lives. See, we now have been brought up or raised or trained or whatever it is to believe that music is to be performed by practiced, polished professionals. That's what we associate with music, with the stars playing on the radio or on the opera or wherever you're watching. People that really know what they're doing. And we forget that for most of human history, the only music that we had available to us is the music that we ourselves made. Music for most of human history has been a very personal and a very communal experience. People would sing or whistle or hum while they worked. And in their off hours, they would find a musical instrument and they would learn how to play it. And they developed styles from all around the world because, well, we got to figure this out somehow. And this is how I know how to play it. So we're going to make this work. And it was a communal thing. People would get together, whether it was on front porches, or whether it was at taverns, or whether it was in church, people would get together and there would be music sung by the people, played by the people. That was, for most of our life, or sorry, for most of our history, for most of humanity's existence, that's what music was. People getting together and raising their voices together. Music was passed down taught from parent to child, from one generation to the next. And we learn the songs, and we learn the lyrics, and we learn the tunes, we learn the nuances, we learn the harmonies. And then we taught them to the next. 
But people don't harmonize anymore. Not like we used to. We are growing up in church. Whenever we sang hymns, we always seemed to harmonize. The congregation just knew how to do it. Because all of our hymns, every hymn written in this book, is written out in a four part harmony. You have soprano, alto, tenor, and bass. And everyone knew their part. Whether they could sing it or not, that's not the question. They knew it. <laughs> we get together and we would sing our parts. And I always loved as a kid, always loved when we got those songs where on the chorus the men would have an echo. I remember those songs. It is well, it is well with my soul, with my soul. Right, I remember being a kid having to imitate my dad. You know, I was too great. So. We don't do that anymore. I don't know why. If, you know, when I'm up here, I have to sing the lead part. If you're singing that echo part, please do it a little bit louder. I don't want to hear you. <laughs> that was always a part of, of worship. That was always a part of being community together, singing these hymns, these old songs that are passed down generation to generation, and learning your parts and singing them together. In fact, that's what Methodists were known for for years and years and years. Methodists, if you're going to be a Methodist, you've got to learn to sing. And even if you go to the beginning of our hymnal, you have Wesley's rules for singing, and one of his first rules is do it lustily. I love it, lustily. That means with enthusiasm. Sing with enthusiasm. Methodists were so known for singing in harmony that Garrison Keillor wrote a whole essay about not only Methodists singing in harmony, but how we teach our kids to sing in harmony. But we've lost that somewhere along the way. But we still sing the hymns, and I think we should. I think hymns are very important to us. I'd love to go back and reclaim harmonies, but at least we can hold on to the hymns. Because hymns are important. And I'll tell you why. First off, hymns teach us theology. The hymns that we sing in here, they are words about God, the words to God, sometimes the words from God, but straight out of Scripture. They teach us how God's Word interacts with our lives, their shared experiences, their testimonies and witnesses that people have put down to tombs. Hymns are also prayer. I can't tell you how many times I've had someone in grief or someone going through a hard time ask to sing, it is well with my soul. Because they understand that to be a prayer that they need to pray. That though it might not be well with my soul right now, it will be well with my soul. The hymns teach us these things. And they do a really good job of it. There's something about putting words and music together that makes connections in your brain that otherwise cannot be made. How many times have you seen an adult trying to find something in alphabetical order and singing the alphabet song to themselves? <laughs> Some folks never quite get past that level of learning. Seth. Seth. <laughs> 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 but when we put words to music, it sticks in our brains better. That playlist I mentioned, almost 900 country songs, I can sing along word for word, but not quite, but almost every single one. Same is true of our hymns. It sticks in our brains. And when we're in that moment where we need a prayer, when we're at a loss for words to say to God, but we know something needs to be said, then we can pull out those hymns. We remember those tunes and those lyrics, and we can pray even when we don't know how to pray. And hymns also establish us as a community, as a family. Because we get to sing these songs together, we get to harmonize together. But also when one of us can't see, when we're in a place where we need these words but we just can't get them out, then the rest of us can gather around and pray those words, sing that hymn, lift that person up together. When you can't sing, I can sing for you. It's an amazing thing. This week saw the beginning of Lent. 
you know it's Lent because all of the fast food uh, restaurants now have their fish sandwiches on sale. <laughs> Lent is that season of preparation leading up to Easter where we know that we're supposed to give stuff up. But oftentimes that's, that's put down as kind of this is the time for Christians to go on a diet. But Lent's not about just giving up something to give up something. Lent is about preparation. It's a reflection of the 40 days that Jesus spent in the wilderness fasting and praying to prepare himself to go into the world, to proclaim the good news. In the same way, we are to discipline ourselves in that. Not by, okay, well, we're going to give up chocolate. No, I mean, maybe that's what you need to do. But the idea is we're supposed to give up those things that are keeping us from God. And we're supposed to put on practices that draw us closer to both of giving up and taking up. And the whole point is to be prepared for the building up of God's kingdom in this world, to be in ministry with Jesus Christ for the redemption of the world. You see, the world can't be transformed by us until we ourselves are transformed by God's grace. And so this year for Lent, we're going to let Him guide us. I've got a different hymn to go along with each uh, day, or sorry, each Sunday in Lent. And we're going to look at these hymns. We're going to understand what these hymns teach us. We're going to look at scripture and see what the scriptures teach us. And we're going to look at the disciplines that we need to cultivate in our lives. And we're going to learn this together. Our first hymn this Lent is Come Sinners to a Gospel Feast. Now, I admit that this is not one of the best known hymns in our hymn. Y'all will probably know it better now than you did six years ago because it's one of my favorite hymns. I like to pull it out very well. Come, sinners, to the gospel feast. It's a great year. It was written by Charles Wesley, who is the younger brother of John Wesley, who was the one that founded the Methodist Church. And Charles, like his older brother, was a traveling preacher. But he was also a very prolific hymn writer. This is the part where I need a little bit of um, participation from y'all, but if you're at Bible study on Thursday, you're not allowed to answer these questions. <laughs> How many hymns do you think Charles Wesley wrote in his lifetime? Give me an idea. A whole lot. A whole lot. <laughs> <laughs> Give me an idea. Throw out some numbers. 300. 300. Hi. 500. Hi. 1,000. Hi. Two thousand. Higher. Not that. We need the auctioneer's voice here. Got two thousand, three thousand over here. <laughs> six thousand. Six thousand five hundred. Six thousand five hundred hymns. That means that if he wrote hymns from the time that he was in college until he died, he averaged ninety-four hymns a year. Yo, I don't even write fifty-two sermons a year. 94 hymns a year for his entire life. Of those 6,500 hymns, how many do you think made it into our modern hymnals? 47. 47, you're close. 41. Of that 6,500 hymns, 41 made it into our hymn. And I looked the other day through, I went through all 41 of them that are in here with Mark K. I think the church knows this one, they know this one, they don't know that one. Of those 41 hymns, how many do you think that y'all are familiar enough with that we could sing them without y'all getting mad? Two. <laughs> A little bit higher than that. <laughs> 11. Same thing. 11. So out of his 6,500 hymns, we are familiar with 11 of them. And we're only familiar with 11 because Calm Centers to the Gospel Feast is in there twice. It is. In there twice. It's the same hymn, but actually has two different versions of it because Charles Wesley was such a prolific writer that when he originally published Come Sinners, it had 24 verses. Now, I thought maybe we could sing all 24 today, <laughs> but the women's championship game starts at noon, so we're on a schedule here. <laughs> Come sinners to the gospel feast. It's in there twice. It's a song of invitation. 
song of invitation to all of us because all of us are sinners and all of us are invited to the gospel feast. We are invited to Christ's table, which he has set before us. We've been given this invitation from Christ. It's been passed down from generation to generation. As Paul himself said, I give to you what I receive from the Lord. And so today, as we share this, I'm able to give to you what I receive from the Lord. This gospel feast, this holy communion. Communion is a complex and many layered divine mystery. On its most surface level, communion is this religious ritual that we go through. We get a small piece of bread and some kind of a wine or juice. And we eat that together. Some people never go any deeper than that surface level, but there's a lot more to it than that. Communion is a lot more than that. Communion is an invitation. This is why we always begin our liturgy, Christ our Lord invites. Christ our Lord invites to his table all. Because the blood of Jesus Christ is for all. None of us have exclusive rights to it. That's why in the United Methodist Church, we practice what's called an open communion. We understand that here at Christ's table, we are recipients of Christ's grace, but we do not have the rights to it. And we cannot withhold Christ's grace from anyone. Therefore, this table is open to everyone. That's why we're starting here. This Lent. Lent is a season of preparation where our lives are to be transformed so that through our lives the world may be transformed. In order to be transformed, though, we have to accept Christ's invitation. We have to come to his table, come to his cross, receive for ourselves his grace and his redemption. And this is a lifelong process. We're at the start of Lent, but it takes more than 40 days for us to be redeemed. It should take us our entire lives. And we come together at Christ's table, remembering what Christ has done for us. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took the bread, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples. Take, eat. This is my body, which is good for you. This is my blood, which is shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And we gather around and we're told that story over and over and over again until that story becomes a part of our lives and our lives become part of the story. And communion is a chance for us, a chance to respond, to accept the invitation, to come forth confessing our sins and repenting of our own doing. What I love about communion is we get to respond to Christ's invitation in a very real and physical and tactile way. Moving our bodies to receive in our empty hands that which we cannot give to ourselves. Humbling ourselves as beggars looking for bread. Coming to Christ who has the healing that we need. Confession and repentance, these are the first disciplines that any Christian needs in order to be a Christian. Confessing our wrongdoing and turning away from it. We must learn to do this as followers of Jesus Christ, and we must practice this regularly. We must never pass up the opportunity to examine ourselves and see where we have done wrong and where Christ is compelling us to come. <clears throat> Learn to do right. And so as we take communion, we always begin with that confession, that prayer. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with all of us. You see, we pass this along one to another, generation to generation. We have received from Christ, let us give it to Christ. Because that's how communion works. See, at the end of that meal, you're not invited to stay. Instead, at the end of the meal, you're told to go out 
to leave, to go forward. To those that need this more. To those who have not heard the invitation. To those who have not responded to Christ. He tells us to go out to the highways and the byways. To shake the edges. To go wherever people are and let them know. The Savior has come. The Savior has died. The Savior has risen again. See, when we have received for ourselves the good news, when we have received ourselves the salvation of Jesus Christ, when we have feasted at his table, we will want others to receive that as well. So let us begin this journey of Lent by confessing our sins before God and for each other, by accepting the invitation that is given to us. Let us begin by coming sinners to this gospel piece. He will turn and have most of the page tonight. Christ our Lord invites to his table all, all who love him, all who earnestly repent of their sin, all who seek to live in peace with God and one another. Therefore, let us confess our sins before God and each other. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. And we have not loved our neighbors. And we have not loved our Forgive us for the way. Free us from the Lord and Lord Jesus. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, it is right, right to give our thanks and praise. It is right. And a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending weeping. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of the suffering, death, and resurrection, we have birth to your church. Deliver us from slavery, a sin, and death, and made with us a new covenant by the water and the spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us and took bread, <clears throat> gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his side, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this as often as you want, and remember such a When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his side, and said, Drink from this all of it. This is my blood of the new covenant for out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts of Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ all before us as we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ is died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. For out of your Holy Spirit, let us gather here on these gifts of bread and wine. May them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his death. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory when we feast as heaven and earth. Your Son, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Church, honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. <clears throat> the 
body of Christ was broken for you. The blood of Christ was shed for you. The Lord's table is made ready and the invitation is given. The Lord sent this invitation as well. It doesn't matter if you're a member here or not, if you've been baptized or not. You must simply be willing to accept the invitation. We begin on this side from front to back. We come forward and gather around the altar rail. We will be given a piece of the bread and all of All is made ready. As you have received, so go forth to give. Grace upon grace. <clears throat>
Any who are unable to come. You turn your hymn list number 616. Stand as you are comfortable as we sing our first song of Lent. Come, sinners, to the gospel feast. Number 616.